Wow, I've never used a microphone before. This is actually kind of terrifying. This is also the biggest audience I've ever had. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, Linux portability. Uh, originally, I was going to talk about kernel portability, but I decided to make it a bit more generic uh, to make it more broad for people. Um, so about me, I've been working on Linux portability and ports of Linux for pretty much, pardon me? Oh, like 15 years now. Uh, I started, got, got started with Debian. Uh, porting it to uh, HPPA when PRS was a big thing back in like the uh, early 2000s uh, with some friends, uh, some of whom are here right now. Um, uh, then I got involved with uh, Ubuntu and that got me a job at Red Hat and I started working on Fedora. Uh, and most recently I started working on ARM and uh, ARC64 for Red Hat and uh, dealing with a lot of bring up issues there because adding a new platform to user space, especially one that's kind of cutting edge and hasn't existed before in upstream uh, is an interesting challenge. I've done work on the kernel and the tool chain and glibc and all sorts of things like that. I kind of touch a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I, I like to have fun and not uh, limit myself to one, uh, one project. So Linux portability. Uh, I'm gonna start with like just anecdotes and jokes and uh, funny, uh, funny things and pitfalls that uh, befall people porting applications between architectures. And the first one I want to talk, oh, first about Linux. Linux was initially 3D6 only. It was mostly, it used a lot of hardware support uh, for task switching and things like that the x86 provided. Uh, it was pretty non-portable for the first uh, couple years of its existence. Um, then uh, Linus got an alpha uh, from DEC. And the uh, it, Alpha's interesting architecture was one of the first 64-bit, uh, it was a 64-bit only architecture, so it had no legacy support, uh, like uh, Spark and PowerPC and other, other uh, architectures have. It was little endian like x86, so it was kind of simple in that respect, but uh, it was you know the, the, the first port that Linus did uh, himself, mostly, uh, to uh, another architecture. Then, uh, then they added Spark, which is really weird. Uh, it's a uh, it's big end in unlike x86. It has something called a register window, which means that uh, some of the registers get pushed to the stack every time you do a function call and things like that, uh, which is kind of weird. It needed uh, it had um, certain uh, Spark CPUs required uh, you to do things in different ways. So it had to run, it had to runtime patch the kernel at runtime or uh, at boot time to uh, not call instructions that were invalid on that ar that certain CPU, and it had a more complicated caching system. Uh, x86 is really kind of Everything to do with uh, virtual uh, address-based caching uh, is taken care of in hardware. Uh, on Spark, a lot of that had to be done manually, and that added uh, some complication to the kernel uh, in order to make sure that um, you know uh, things worked out properly. Then we have, they added MIPS and ARM and PIRISC and I64 and uh, all sorts of other things. <laughs> and I, I think Linux, Linux is now uh, easily the most portable architecture, or post most portable, portable kernel in the world. Uh, NetBSD probably still claims to be, but they count their ports in a different way, and they're liars. <laughs> Incendiary comment. So the first thing I want to talk about, one of the issues I see a lot uh, when porting software, or when building software for ARM uh, recently, is uh, dealing with char signedness. So uh, it ends up being kind of hilarious because you can set a, a char C equals negative one and then compare it against zero, but unfortunately, the sinus of char isn't defined by C like the uh, sinus of int is. So on some architectures, like PPC, ARM, AR64, S390, uh, char is actually unsigned by default. So uh, this uh, comparison against zero is always gonna be true because it's never actually gonna be negative one. Um, and on x86 and everything sane, it's uh, signed. Uh, you can, <laughs> comparison wise, uh, if you grep across GCC's source, you can see which ports uh, use which, and uh, sign kind of wins by about 10 or 11 in this case. Uh, one of those is actually like PowerPC on, uh, on Linux and AIX is uh, signed, or unsigned rather, but on uh, OS X, they decided to make it signed for some reason and match everything else. Because I guess they wanted to make their lives easy. So it ends up being a compiler warning not a, and, a, and a runtime error because you're uh, now taking uh, conditions that you didn't think would be true to be true. So this is one of the benefits of building your software with W error because uh, the build will break and you can go and fix this. Or at, uh, well, sometimes it's not easy to fix because you have to now change the data types of all sorts of things all across your source tree. Uh, you can add F sign care to C flags to make GCC actually generate sign care, uh, sign char, um, uh, make, it as, make it assign char data type uh, implicitly. 
and that'll work around it, um, but not everybody wants to do that. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is endianness, uh, byte order. Um, why do we care about this? For uh, one, for one, one case, uh, um, <laughs> byte order is uh, the way we lay out um, multi-byte multi data types like int, which would be 32-bit, uh, four, uh, eight, uh, four eight-bit bytes uh, packed in some way in memory. And it could either be most significant byte first, in which case the, uh, or a least significant byte first, depending on which order the, uh, so the uh, highest bit in, ends up being in uh, memory. We care about this for a bunch of reasons. One of which is uh, when you read a, when you want to move, a, say, a USB stick from device to device, uh, the file system is going to be written in one a certain way. And when you read back, uh, say, the uh, super block, uh, every field is either, either you know a, a U16 or a 32-bit data type. Um, when you read that back, you're trying to interpret it in one, in one way. And if it was written in an opposite way, you're going to read an invalid value. So most file systems have some uh, magic 32-bit uh, value in their super block that when you read it can, will tell you which, whether you're reading it one way or the other. And this is nice because it means we can now byte swap everything. On the other hand, this also means that if you're on the architecture, on another architecture that has, uses a different uh, endianness to the uh, one the file system was written with, you now have to byte swap every, every uh, multi-byte uh, read you do. That. Um, now, obviously, this is a, uh, a inter interesting uh, uh, tangent or whatever. Uh, EXT2 and, and such on Linux uh, all uh, define the file system to be little endian. So, on a big endian machine, you'd byte swap everything before you write it to disk. Um, some, are, uh, some OSs decide not to do this. Uh, on BSD, for instance, you can't actually move a, an FFS. Uh, file system between multiple machines if they're on uh, a different endianness. We also care for networking reasons. Uh, when you send a packet across the network, if you're talking to a big endian host, uh, you're going to have to byte swap if you're a little endian host. Fortunately, TCP, IP, and uh, network protocols are basically defined to be big endian for some historical reason that I'm not actually sure of. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so uh, we have to, uh, if, you're, um, well, if you're on a little endian machine, like an x86, you have to byte swap everything before you transmit it across the network. Um, uh, for instance, uh, for another uh, case, PCI is little endian. So if you're uh, writing a device driver on, uh, for, to run on Linux, you have to, um, you have to care about whether, when you read a, uh, do a uh, memory mapped I.O. Uh, access, a read or a write, you have to care about the endianness, uh, you, have to, it, you have to byte swap um, in your driver, uh, which is usually handled by a wrapper function, but because uh, because PCI is defined to be a little endian on a, that's it. Yes, sorry, uh, I thought that was a question. Um, uh, I lost my place. Anyway, anyway, on, and uh, for other things, the, the, the native byte order is usually the right thing on, on your bus. Uh, another another interesting issue uh, for portability is alignment. Uh, alignment basically means that uh, certain data types have to be uh, re read or write from addresses which are congruent with the uh, width of the data type. What that means is that a four-byte uh, int must be aligned on a four-byte boundary. So it couldn't be accessed at address three. It would have to be accessed at address zero or four, uh, or one or four. Well, it started from zero, you know. Uh, there's three ways that our processor handles this. First one is like x86 and PowerPC do. They fix it up in hardware to be uh, by by issuing a bunch of one byte reads or something else to uh, emulate if it was aligned. And this is uh, great for a programmer because it's really easy, but it also means that it ends up slowing your code down because uh, you're accessing things uh, unaligned. The second option is to take a trap, which is what a bunch of other architectures do, like Spark and Power, um, Spark and MIPS and uh, other things. So you'll take a trap and you'll go into the kernel and uh, have to uh, you'll run an unaligned exception handler, which will do what the CPU would have done on the x86 and read, multi uh, read single byte reads uh, and then present the register as if it uh, hadn't trapped at all. So that's okay, but that's even slower than doing it in hardware. And your third option is to do what ARM did before ARM v6 and just return bad data, which is really <laughs> not helpful. 
this ends up, this is a, well, one of the biggest problems I had when I started working on uh, ARM uh, for the, uh, Debian for the Netwinder uh, in like 2002 or something like that was uh, a lot of software would just uh, crash in certain really random ways and that ended up being because they were accessing unaligned. Yep. Well, <laughs> it's fast but your software won't do, do what you want. Anyway, they ended up fixing that in ARMv7 and ARMv7 will now trap and allow you to fix it up like uh, other architectures do. So what are the implications of alignment? On x86 and x86-64, uh, uh, one of the interesting cases is that um, uh, <laughs> uh, in, if you're defining a struct, uh, the alignment of a 64-bit element uh, in a struct, it differs between the x86-64 and x, uh, i386 uh, ABIs. So if you're um, trying to share uh, something between the two, you have to implicitly add padding because a 64-bit uh, um, variable in a struct will only be uh, int aligned, 32-bit aligned on 32-bit uh, x86. And so you have to deal with this and uh, add padding to make sure that the struct looks properly, it looks proper between the two of them. Um, that, add, that, that can affect the layout of structs. Uh, this is one thing that perf does really well. Uh, perf passes a lot of structs between user space and uh, the kernel. And uh, it paid a lot of attention to uh, how the structs ended up being laid out uh, for both uh, both the ABIs because if you're doing a, uh, uh, if you're implementing syscalls where you can have a compatibility mode between say, you know, you want to run a 32-bit application on your 64-bit CPU like uh, we do with uh, multi-arch, um, you want your, your perf binary to not have to be, you, you want your, uh, your uh, syscalls to not have to have massively complicated fix-ups to uh, ensure that the you can call the 64-bit uh, ioctals or whatever, um, and uh, and so you want to you want to have a common code path, and so to be able to do that, you have to make sure that the the code looks or the uh, the data looks the same on both uh, to both the 32-bit user space and the 64-bit kernel. So as I said, as uh, you have to guarantee the proper alignment. Uh, another interesting, hilarious thing is calling conventions. Uh, this is mostly to do with risk architectures. But uh, register usage is really interesting on uh, a lot of uh, architectures. So for some uh, for some syscalls, you have to say you, you you get a maximum of five arguments for most syscalls, and uh, that means for uh, x86 you may have uh, you know uh, five 32-bit uh, registers on uh, i386, but you get five 64-bit on uh, x86-64, and uh, the on, on other architectures the um, the way you pass 64-bit variables, such as a like uh, offset, which would be 64-bit on basically everything now, uh, ends up being split up into multiple registers. Obviously, you can't fit a 64-bit variable into a 32-bit register, um, but it also has um, also restrictions on which registers they use. So they'll split them into pairs. So you might end up padding and having nothing nothing said in a register and running out of those five uh, slots and ending up having to spill to the stack and uh, copy things. But it reduces the number of arguments available and also makes things complicated. You have to wrap things in glibc uh, and the kernel to handle all this. Um, another interesting thing, page size. So um, 4K, 4K pages is basically what Linux is written to expect. Uh, most things, if they, if they aren't written by people that understand uh, or have, have run things on PowerPC or Spark or whatever, uh, can, can use 4K, uh, will use 4K pages by, as, a, as an assumption. Now, it could be 8K, it's 16K on I64 and things like that. And 64K on PPC64 and some other new architectures like uh, AR64. Interesting. Uh, <laughs> 64K doesn't fit in the U16. You end up with you know, uh, zero being written to a 16-bit variable because you're, you're uh, you know, uh, one off. You're, you're, it needs a 17 bits to express that. But lots of hardware is designed with 16-bit length registers. So what happens? You end up writing zero as your size for a DMA or something like that, and your hardware doesn't work. Well, the funny thing about that is that you're, it's a hardware register that's set like this. You can't actually fix that. You have to go buy a new card if you want to do, uh, if it's a SCSI card or something like that that has this limitation. You either have to set your page size to be lower or uh, split up your write, and that's even more complicated. It makes the driver really difficult, uh, stuff like that. Other hilarious problems. 
the, the kernel is built freestanding. Uh, that means that it doesn't you know, link against any user space code. But it relies on GCC to provide certain functionality that uh, it doesn't, uh, that it needs, especially integer division. Uh, in, on x on 32-bit architectures uh, like uh, thir uh, x86, the, uh, when you use PAE, you end up with a 64-bit DMA adder T uh, data type. This is great, but people do funny things with it. They'll do divides against it when it's really supposed to be, you know, an al aligned size. Um, and the, the result of this is you end up with a GCC callout, and you end up with a build failure because, you know, um, GCC doesn't fast path this. It ends up calling a helper function to do uh, division because it can't do it all in hardware uh, easily on this, on x86, or on 32-bit x86. Uh, we also have code generation issues. Um, lots of tools need to JIT code. This is one of the most common ways things fail. Uh, they, they're, written and they, they're written by people that, you know, uh, they end, you end up, you, you, uh, you write the software for x86, somebody comes along, ports it to PPC or PIPS, somebody comes along, ports it to Spark, but when you add a new architecture, uh, nobody's done it for that yet. And then put the, the problem with this is that uh, once a po piece of software gets really popular, it ends up being a build dependency for a massive amount of your uh, distribution. And um, because of that, to be able to bootstrap your, 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 uh, your port of, say, Fedora or whatever to the new architecture, you have to provide these build dependencies in some way. Uh, and uh, in order to do that, you have to port the, 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 the JIT. That's, you know, that's a, not an insignificant amount of work for certain things like, uh, so in the, in, the, in the old days, everybody wrote their own, but now everybody bundles LLVM, which is great, because you only can port one thing. Unfortunately, LLVM is really complicated. Um, and the, the other problem is some, other, some software bundles LLVM, which means that they, they may ship a separate version that they've supported with their uh, code that isn't the version that, say, a distro would want to ship. Uh, so that causes a lot, of, a lot of issues. There's all sorts of some other stuff. Um, so I want to tell some war stories now. This is just like the last week of bugs I've had to deal with on AR64. Um, it, this should be entertaining, I hope. So I, I, was, I was told of a Python test suite failure. Okay, that's weird. Why would the Python test suite fail? Well, it was the GDB test that was failing. Okay. So GDB was emitting a message that Python, or Python's test GDB wasn't expecting. And it already, ex uh, it already uh, parses and filters a lot of messages that it, uh, that it, uh, that it gets from GDB to make sure that, you know, it, it, it's testing very basic functionality, okay. Well, what's this weird message? Well, GDB was failing to load a shared object from memory. And it was failing. Well, why? Okay, well, what first, what's the shared object? Well, it turned out to be the, uh, the VDSO. And the VDSO is uh, something the kernel implicitly links into every user space process that provides uh, certain functionality, like a fast path to get the uh, time of day, which is like, uh, you know, something that's called really frequently, so we want it to be really fast. Well, why is it failing? Okay. So I debug GDB's, uh, it, it, uh, GDB has a special mode to read the VDSO because uh, the VDSO is in memory, it's not actually on disk anywhere. So GDB has all this code that creates a, uh, what they call a BFD, a binary file descriptor, from the memory of the process you're debugging um, and, and makes it look like it was actually like an on-disk ELF object. Okay, well it's failing doing this, mm, strange. So it's, it's uh, reading the ELF headers out of memory the ELF headers, uh, if you know anything about ELF, ELF defines two things, segments and sections. Uh, segments are, you know, code. It just says code, and, and the sections map into that code. And so segments are really big blobs of, you know, memory that it wants to set up. And they set, you know, you set an address you want the uh, segment at and an alignment for it. Okay, so uh, you debug that. Well, that's weird. The alignment's set to 64K. Hmm, okay. So 64K happens to be the maximum page size on uh, ARC64. And the ELF, when you generate an ELF object, it's gonna, uh, because it doesn't know what the host page size is when it's going to, uh, when you're building the binary, it expects everything to be worst case aligned. Okay, that's fine. So GDB is actually respecting this and masking off the address it's trying to load at. That's a problem. So what it's doing here is truncating the, uh, the lower 16 bits of the address. With the kernel, kernel's built with 4K pages. 
it's only mapping your VDSO at 4K alignment. Okay. GDB chunk ch chops off that 16, those 16 bits and starts re reading from them. Well, guess what? There's nothing mapped there. So GDB seg faults. Boom. So we gotta fix the kernel. The kernel's gotta get fixed. You gotta map the VDSO at 64K alignment. Well, it turns out uh, that works and uh, we fix the thing and the Python test suite now succeeds. Send it upstream. Sadly, the patch is rejected because we can just, uh, we can just drop the alignment requirement from the ELF header and uh, that, that'll work fine because it's always gonna be page size aligned and it's, uh, it's loaded that way. But whatever, fix the bug, happy days. Next, next day. <laughs> Ruby test suite failure. And this one's an interesting one. It's kind of weird. So Ruby was right, has a test that was trying to test the maximum size of an argument it can pass to a, a uh, program. I don't know why it's doing this. It's probably something that you just assume the operating system is capable of doing. But this is what it was doing. Ruby was expecting to receive uh, E2 big back from passing a too big argument to e e exec. But it was getting an Eno mem. That's pretty strange. Hasn't seen this on any other architecture. What the hell's going on? When you actually looked at what, looked at what the, was happening, the kernel was actually concatenating two of the arguments together. So it was missing the, the null byte that would terminate the uh, strings. Well, that's pretty strange. Uh, haven't seen that anywhere before. If you dig, dig into the, uh, the exact code in the kernel, and there's only really one place where it could have been wrong, where we're trying to find the length of the string. And uh, because the kernel isn't you know, user-space code, you don't have the C library, you've got a bunch of functions that kind of look like the C library but are provided by the kernel. This one in particular looked at a suspect called st st well, st Stern and Len user. Okay, well that should look like Stern and Len in user space, right? Well, guess what? It doesn't. This is an architecture optional helper. If you can like define it in your architecture headers and write it in assembly code if you want, but there's a generic one that also does the, uh, the same job. The problem is it doesn't have the same API as the user space one. Uh, well, Stern and Len user also will uh, They'll take a fault if you access a bad user space address or things like that to make sure the kernel doesn't, you know, have uh, security problems. It'll have a fix up for, for accessing bad data. Anyway, here's what, here's what Stern and Len does. You know, it if, the, um, if there's no null byte in the first max, in, in up to max in the string, you return the max. Well, Stern and Len user expects you to get max plus one back. Okay, that's a really weird <laughs> difference for some arbitrary reason, but the Air 64 <laughs> assembly version of this wasn't actually handling this. It was only doing, it was only matching Stern and Lang, not the user version. And it, obviously it was the only architecture that had this problem. That's why the, the Ruby test suite was failing. So we need to add a plus one. So one line patch, wrap the assembler with a, you know, an add, verify to fix the Ruby build, send it upstream. Well, it turns out upstream's already fixed the bug. They didn't know it, they didn't know about it at the time but they dropped it and moved to the generic one because there's no real point fast pathing something that's only used in one place in the kernel. But it needs a backport for stable anyways. So that's one another, another one down. Next bug, GCC pre-compiled headers. So uh, it's been a long-standing issue with uh, pre-compiled headers that nobody really told us about until recently that uh, when they turned on heap and mmap randomization, which means uh, mmaps being loaded at random addresses in the uh, process address space, or occurring at uh, random addresses, and the heap being, you know, where malloc ha happens, uh, breaks pre-compiled headers. So a couple of years ago, people started adding, uh, adding, uh, basically what, it, what uh, GCC does is it tries to mmap uh, a big, big swath of data at address zero and uh, to get, you know, a space to put the pre-compiled header in. And, um, they started noticing when you added uh, enabled address space randomization, this failed. So they started adding special cases for x86, for MIPS, for PPC, for alpha, for everything, uh, which basically turned the, uh, the mmap, which from z when you ma mmap at zero, it'll fail because we're not allowed to, you're not allowed to mmap at zero for security reasons. And it would end up you know, at a random address. Well, this broke, so they just started making it basically turn into a map fixed, which basically picks an address and decides to mmap from there. They pick a, a hint address that's unlikely to have anything mapped at it, so it ends up being a map fixed. So this fixes GCC not to ICE and all sorts of other architectures, but when you're not covered by this massive giant if and def 
this architecture, do this. If, if def this architecture, do that. Uh, well, you start at zero and you fail. And this is a long-standing bug in GCC that nobody's bothered to fix because they just work around it like this. Well, nobody told us. Eric 64 wasn't covered by this. And so for weeks, we've had, uh, we had OpenJDK and uh, another, another uh, WX widgets for GTK failing to build because they would try to use pre-compiled headers and then just fail if uh, address space randomization was turned on. You could just write to proc and fix that, but that's really not a great solution for production use. <laughs> So you really kind of want address-based randomization turned on. Uh, so go through GCC, find the bug, uh, add, the, add an address, pick, pick an address, any address, write it back, send the patch, boom, it fobs your uncle, done. So that, that was the, those are the last two weeks of uh, interesting error 64 bugs. I'd be happy to answer any questions if anybody has them. Yes. <laughs> That's a tough one because uh, a lot of the, a lot of it got fixed by PowerPC when we started building Fedora for PowerPC back in the day. Uh, so it hasn't been quite as bad for ARM. There's still quite a few cases where, um, there's still quite a few cases where software has a big, you know, if def this architecture, this this architecture, this architecture chain in their headers somewhere, and you have to fix that up um, because you end up hitting the f a fallback path that assumes that char will be signed, uh, and that's kind of a problem. But it, it's probably I think Mar if Marson's here anywhere, he can probably answer better because he's done a lot of the, uh, the package building too, or most of it actually, for AR64 right now. And uh, I'd say it's probably it's probably been like five to ten packages that have uniquely failed that way on our AR64 right now. Anybody else? Yep. So it was every. Uh, uh, it was randomly, when you used GCC to build with pre-compiled headers, you were randomly getting the, the oh no, it was, ju it was, it was just, uh, just because of the way GCC uses the MMAP, it ended up being a sort of a sporadic failure while you're building the software. So you could, uh, you could run make and it would, you know, fail once, you run it again, it would succeed, and then eventually it would fail again. And so it was really hard to, uh, we use a build system called, well, if you, if you know Red Hat, we use a build system called Koji or Brew. Uh, that'll just fail to build if anything fails. You can't retry it. So to, to actually get things building with MMAP randomization turned on, we had to fix the, the GCC bug. No. No, no, this is, um, it, GCC does some really weird things with the MMAP it creates. It sort of like makes it, then takes it away, and assumes it can get it back again. And because if you have address space randomization uh, turned on, you might end up with another MMAP there and it can't get that back, and it goes all wonky. Mm -hmm. I'd be interested in talking about those. Yeah, we, um, we've only just switched back to uh, 64K pages were kind of, we've been trying to bring up AR64 with UEFI, and UEFI didn't, didn't actually specify that that was, uh, they weren't, passing things with, with 64K alignment, so we couldn't actually use it. So we've been building with 4K pages on X, uh, AR64 for a while now. We've only just finally gone back, I think, uh, in like the last week. So we'll probably find new bugs that way. <laughs> Anybody else? Sure. I'm actually really happy with AR64. It, uh, it's the like least weird architecture I've done recently. Um, it, 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 no, it, it, it fixes all the problems that ARM had. Uh, ARM was pretty weird, and the Air 64 is nice and sane. And when they drop compat mode for the old ARM, for the chip, it'll be even saner. Um, it's quite nice. It, it actually looks a lot like PPC 64, really. I mean, no, oh, come on, man. Yeah, you can do, you do what I64 did and have both. Anybody? Of auto tools, yeah. so uh, <laughs> I mean, auto, auto tools is the best worst solution, right? I mean, it's it's awful, but everything else sucks worse. Um, <laughs> well, 
the problem with auto tools is that you have to actually go and update, when you add a new architecture like this, you have to go and update your config.guess and all that sort of stuff. And that's been one of the big problems we had on Eric 64 bring up, is you had to, we had all this software that didn't have, it had out of date config.guess files that we had to copy in new ones for before you could actually get a build that would succeed because you'd go and, you know, tell it's AR64 Linux GNU and it would just be like, what the hell's that? And fail. Um, so that's been, I'm early, wow. I guess I talk really quickly. Anybody else? Yep, sorry. Oh, nice to meet you, man. It's nice, isn't it? I don't think we'll be able to fix your ELF v2 issues, though. It kind of gives you a, a very humbling appreciation for how difficult it must be to port proprietary software to another architecture because they don't have the many eyes scrutiny that, you know, we kind of do. Uh, the hobbyist porting, you know, Debian in their basement to M68K or whatever the hell, uh, it, that turns out to be really valuable because you end up fixing things for the next guy down the road that um, has to use the same assumptions. Uh, it's been very, it, it's, it's a very interesting uh, thing to deal with. Yes? Yeah, yeah. No, it's been a, uh, I don't know, I've, I, somehow I got pigeonholed or whatever into doing this for so many years, and it's been a very interesting career uh, I've had so far. Um, it's a lot of random bugs. <laughs> Oh God, um, <laughs> I don't know. I haven't done a lot of work with Clang uh, yet, but um, I've done a lot of LLVM stuff for ARM recently, um, and that's involved doing some fixes to LLVM's back end for Clang. And it's uh, <laughs> I don't envy people that have. To, I mean, GCC is basically the de facto standard for Linux and Unix, open Unix, uh, for the last you know what, 15, 20 years. And uh, LLVM now has to play catch up in all the bizarre functionality that we assume exists from the compiler that uh, you know um, won't be provided. Especially like porting the kernel to Clang has been a really hilarious <laughs> thing to watch because we ab we we abuse GCC in new and interesting ways every new kernel version. Um, and you know 
the, the Clang people need to provide support for that. And uh, I, I, I don't know how much Apple's ownership of that now uh, affects that, but uh, I guess because FreeBSD is now using Clang, I think, as their default compiler, that uh, they might fix a lot of things for us now. I don't, I don't, I don't like, I, I like GCC, it's fine. <laughs> it's, it's a well understood problem. <laughs> Anybody else? Yes? No. Um, it's just a, I think it's uh, ARM64 defines three, three page sizes, uh, 4K, uh, 16K, I think. But the 16K is optional, and then 64K. And because our options are only six, maybe 16K and 64K, we've decided that you know 4K is not really enough uh, with uh, the size of Data getting, you know, an applications. Yep. Right. Yep. Well, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The uh, <laughs> the <laughs> the number of <laughs> I probably shouldn't tell this story. If you build a kernel with uh, a certain enterprise operating systems config for PPC64 with 64K pages, and look at the number of compiler warnings you get for things not fitting in new 16s, you might be ple pleasantly and hilariously surprised. Like, <laughs> we might claim to support some drivers that just never will work. <laughs> any, any other questions, please? We good? Thank you very much for coming.